Trans-Canadian Railway Journey. Good evening. Tonight, you will embark on one of the most famous train journeys as you board the Trans-Canadian train and ride from the Canadian East Coast in Nova Scotia all the way to the West Coast in Vancouver. So, tuck yourself into bed, take a deep breath, and allow your whole body to relax. When you're all settled in, close your eyes and let's begin our journey. You're currently in Nova Scotia. As you wait for your transcontinental train journey to begin, you take a stroll along the Halifax waterfront. The boardwalk is alive with musicians setting up for the day in the mid-morning sun. You listen to an older man warming up his fingers on the strings of his acoustic guitar, and you continue on your way. As you walk, you inhale the salty air carried by the breeze. A train whistles from somewhere just out of view signaling that it's time for you to start your voyage. On your way to the station, you pass an ice cream stand playing sea shanties from its radio. With a lingering glance, you think back on the taste of the last ice cream you enjoyed. But you have a train to board, and so you keep walking. On your way to the train station, you also pass a fisherman with a scraggly gray beard casting his rod into the ocean. You make it to the end of the boardwalk and take a final look back at the ferry puttering across the harbor in front of the forest green McDonald Bridge. The train station is next to a farmer's market where families and couples walk through rows of produce and handmade jewelry. You walk into the Georgian-style station and rumbling luggage wheels echo around you as you make your way to the platform where your train is waiting. You check your ticket for your seat number and search the length of the train for your sleeper car. When you find it, a woman wearing an all-black uniform examines your ticket and welcomes you aboard. You enter your boxcar and walk down the aisle until you reach the door of your sleeper cabin. As you step inside, the scent of lavender hangs in the air, emanating from the jar of dried flowers next to a cozy bed facing a window. You lie on the crisp sheet pulled tightly over the mattress, fluff your pillow, and pull the blanket over yourself. The train lets out a bellowing whistle and rolls into motion. Slow at first, but picking up speed as it leaves the city. Your journey will take you more than 3,600 miles across the North American continent through eight of Canada's 10 provinces. You'll experience everything from the bluffs of the Rocky Mountains to the urban sites of cities like Toronto Montreal, and Quebec City. 
other passengers chatter in excitement in the nearby cabins as their journey too begins. The urban landscape around you disappears and you enter a forest filled with lush canopies of alder trees growing along steep, rocky cliffs. Some of the trees grow so close to the track that their branches scratch against the glass of your window. After some time, the forest thins out and you enter the countryside. Not far from the track is a red barn surrounded by an old wooden fence. Sheep graze around the barn and watch the train pass. Their fleece seems to mirror the fluffy white clouds hanging in the morning sky above them. Eventually, the reddish sand of the Bay of Fundy comes into view, famous for having the highest tides in the world. At this moment, the tides are out and copper-colored mudflats stretch as far as the eye can see. Fishing boats sit in the silt and await the next tide that will set them afloat again. People walk across the mudflats carrying buckets filled with freshly dug clams. A young boy kneels in the mud next to his mother as he shovels sand into a bucket and tips it to make a sandcastle. As you near the New Brunswick border, you traverse across marshland. They are dotted with great blue herons standing still among the green marsh grass. You take a deep breath, plump your pillow, and adjust yourself in your bed. All your senses lulled by the train now riding along water, shimmering in the sunlight. Before long, you roll into the city of Moncton. You can hear passengers get off and on, their conversations an almost even mix of English and French. As you set off again, the fluffy white clouds outside your window begin to grow darker and the landscape transitions from city to forest, periodically breaking into plots of farmland. It starts to rain, drops thrumming rhythmically against the steel roof of the train slowly at first, and then harder. Your window is marbled with long rivulets of water, relaxing you further. You pass through a small community filled with acreages and old farmhouses. Behind one of the acreages, a young boy wearing yellow rain boots jumps into a puddle with a squeal of laughter before running across the muddy yard toward a wooden swing set. Each town you pass resembles the one before it. In each town, silos filled with barley and wheat, century-old churches with oxidized copper roofs, Hockey players carrying their equipment bags into community rinks. You pull your blanket closer around you, sinking into its warmth as you watch raindrops fall into the puddles on rust-colored dirt roads.
you leave the farmland behind and enter the heavily forested interior en route to the Quebec border. The low branches of balsam fir at the edge of the track scratch against your window. Perhaps it's only your imagination, but your car seems to become filled with the rich fragrance of the trees. The train passes over a metal truss bridge with large iron supports spanning across a river, its waters gushing a hundred feet below. A few deer stand on the rocky shore with their heads bowed into the water as they drink. Soon, the river becomes a distant memory as you return to the forest. A freight train passes yours from the other direction, letting out a bellowing whistle. You absent-mindedly watch the shipping containers pass by. The rhythmic sound of the wheels against the track is almost enough to lull you to sleep. You take a deep breath and slowly exhale as you enjoy the feeling of calmness that has washed over you. Fir tree after fir tree passes by your window as the train continues through northern New Brunswick. The rain stops and you can see the same fluffy clouds you saw when you departed from Nova Scotia. You arrive at the Quebec border. Most of the passengers getting onto the train speak in French and they chit chat as they settle into their seats for their long journey. You've already traveled more than 500 miles, but still have a long way to go to reach the Pacific Ocean. The next leg of your journey takes you across the base of the Gaspe Peninsula. Eventually, you can see the St. Lawrence River over the tops of the trees growing along the banks. At first, its vastness resembles the ocean. It isn't until you look closer that you can see the sloping shores of the far bank. Over 700 miles long, the St. Lawrence River links the Great Lakes with the Atlantic Ocean. More than 20% of the world's fresh water is contained in the Great Lakes, and it all has to flow through this river to make it back to the ocean. Along the St. Lawrence River are many townships that you travel through. Rimouski, Trois Pistoles, Riviere du Loup. On the far side of the river, the Laurentian Mountains rise into the horizon. The train winds away from St. Lawrence and passes through farmland with alternating green and golden fields. Herds of black and white cows graze in the pastures. You observe the quiet countryside for some time until you reach Quebec City. Here, the train stops long enough for you to take a walk along the old streets of what's often considered the most European city in North America. The cobblestone streets are alive with tourists buzzing in and out of the many gift shops and restaurants. After spending some time admiring the city, you stop for lunch at a bistro. As you sit on the patio 
with a warm French onion soup. You gaze at the architecture of the pale gray stone buildings dating back to the 1700s. When the waiter comes by to offer you dessert, he tells you that the city itself dates back to 1608. Once you finish eating, you head back to the station. On your stroll, you pass through an alleyway with red, indigo, and yellow umbrellas hanging from the tops of the buildings. And all around you, you can hear the clinking of dishes in the kitchens of the restaurants. You settle back in your cabin and cozy up in bed under your blanket. The train takes off again, continuing onward for another 200 miles along the St. Lawrence River. After a few hours, it arrives on the island of Montreal, and you watch the city's tall glass buildings sparkle in the sunlight. The train stops at Central Station, and a flurry of passengers get on and off. For many, this stop marks the end of their voyage. But for others who are now boarding the train, it's the beginning of their journey to Toronto, which is about 300 miles away. After a short while, the train starts up again, en route to the northern shores of Lake Ontario. As the train travels along the edges of the choppy water, you search the horizon for the far side of the lake. Although it has the smallest surface area of all five great lakes, Lake Ontario is still too wide to see across. Far in the distance, a shipping container with a rusty hull is heading back toward the St. Lawrence River. After some time, trees begin to thin out, giving way to the high-rises of Toronto. The CN Tower's needle-like silhouette juts out of the skyline above the surrounding buildings. It is the tallest building in Canada and one of the highest freestanding structures in the world. The train comes to a halt at Union Station. As passengers get off, you watch businessmen and women carrying their briefcases filter out. It's been hours since you left Montreal and you step out onto the platform to stretch your legs. When you return inside the train, most seats are empty. The remaining passengers seem to be like you, travelers heading across the country in search of adventure. You settle back into your cabin once more and the train slowly pulls away from Union Station. The next leg of your journey will take you more than 1,000 miles through Ontario toward the next major city, Winnipeg. The train heads northward around Lake Erie and through the rugged Canadian Shield all around are boreal forests dense with spruce, pine, and fir trees. You wind around a still lake, which reflects back the Nordic tree line on the far shore. On its muddy edge, a majestic moose wades knee-deep 
in the water. Ducks fly overhead in a perfect V and disappear from view over the train as they head south. Gray clouds appear low in the sky, forming a lingering mist over the forests and lakes as you pass. As you stare into the misty landscape, your eyes grow tired. You close them and listen to the rhythmic churning of the wheels. The clunking sound over the tracks lulls you into a light sleep for a few moments. When you open your eyes again, the train is crossing a causeway that cuts across a lake. A large flock of marsh birds scatters from the grass, pivoting in the air in unison. You alternate between sleep and wakefulness as you pass the communities in Northern Ontario, Richon, CU Lookout, Karamat, Oba, and others. The landscape flattens out as you leave Ontario behind you and enter Manitoba, the beginning of your journey across the Canadian prairies. In Manitoba, the fifth province of your trans-Canadian journey, the Atlantic becomes a distant memory. So do the Laurentian Mountains and the towering buildings of Montreal and Toronto. The train rolls along a straight stretch of track. Occasionally, it whistles as a freight train passes in the opposite direction, but otherwise, it continues forward, uninterrupted, on the long, straight track with the same rhythmic clunking. Forests thin out again, and clouds open up, giving way to the Canadian prairies. Golden fields of wheat stretch for as far as you can see. As the sun warms your face through the window, you watch a few cotton candy clouds drift in a now crisp blue sky over scattered farmhouses. The train approaches Winnipeg, and once again, glass buildings rise in the distance. The city isn't nearly as large as the cities you passed in Quebec and Ontario, but with almost 800,000 people, it will be the largest city you'll travel through until you reach Edmonton, two provinces away. train sets off through the golden fields again. You watch a tractor cut stalks of hay in a field so large that it seems to go on forever. After some time traveling through the prairies, you decide to stretch your legs. You take a walk through the boxcars until you find one with a glass observation roof. A man wearing a Toronto Blue Jays hat looks at you with a smile. So flat you can see your dog running away for days, isn't it? He says. You laugh and agree with him before continuing on your way. When you return to your cabin, the terrain remains largely unchanged, a checkerboard of green and golden field, only sometimes punctuated by small rural communities. Each one announces its name on the side of a grain elevator 
next to the track. Portage La Prairie, Melville, Watrous. Passing into Saskatchewan, you begin seeing canola fields stretching into the horizon like a streak of yellow paint against a blue canvas. The train continues west, making a short stop in Saskatoon. You leave the city, and in no time, you see the grain elevators of other small towns, Big R, Landis, Unity. You leave Saskatchewan behind and enter Alberta, the second last province on your voyage. The landscape has remained much the same since you left Ontario. For some time, you follow the highway and watch the cars traveling in the same direction. Yawning, you close your eyes again and relax in your bed as you wait for the next stop. It doesn't take long for you to fall asleep with the sun's warmth against your face. When you wake again, the train is stopped in Edmonton as passengers get on and off. You stay in bed relaxing, enjoying the sound of chattering travelers outside your cabin. The train eventually takes off again, leaving over 3,000 miles of tracks behind since the beginning of your journey, and rolls westward. Farmland becomes more and more distant giving way to alpine forests. You enter the foothills of the Canadian Rockies, and as the train begins its ascent, you feel a slight pressure in your ears. Before long, you can see jagged, snow-capped mountains. The train passes through a tunnel casting your cabin into darkness for a short moment. When you emerge in the daylight again, you can see the shimmering turquoise waters of Jasper Lake. Dunes filled with rose bushes, willow trees, and thick stalks of grass roll along the lake. The train continues to climb upward, gaining altitude. As more mountains appear on the horizon, spruce trees along the track become less dense. A mother black bear and her cub emerge out of the woods, casting a nervous glance toward the train as you pass. There's no shortage of wildlife in the mountains. As you hug the edge of the cliff, overlooking the Athabasca River, you can see elk drinking from the clear mountain water below and mountain goats grazing on the bluffs above you. You stop at Jasper Station, surrounded by mountains 10,000 feet high. Mount Edith Cavill Pyramid Mountain, the Whistlers, and the Victoria Cross Range. Several tour groups get off the train carrying climbing equipment and sleeping bags. You also step off for a bit of fresh air and walk through downtown Jasper. Its shops and restaurants tucked away between the snow-capped peaks crisp mountain air might be the freshest you've ever experienced. Coolness enters your lungs, and when you exhale, 
your breath swirls in front of you. You get back on the train. Now there are even fewer passengers. The train continues to snake through the mountains as heavy clouds cover the sky. Pellets of rain drum against your window, but the train quickly passes through the storm. As you look back at the peaks you've already passed, you can see a rainbow shining across the sky, ending somewhere behind the Victoria Cross Range and seeming to start at the Miette River, which flows through Jasper Park. The train continues through Yellowhead Pass, the dividing line between Alberta and the last province on your trip, British Columbia. You continue your journey through the mountains, winding along the steep cliffs and crossing over gushing glacial rivers. After crossing a rusty bridge that spans a large canyon, a lake comes into view with water the color of the Caribbean Sea. Snowy mountains reflect off the water as a triage of Canadian geese flies across the sky. You watch in amazement all the beautiful vistas around you. It is unlike anything you've ever seen before. Sometimes it's hard to believe that such untouched natural beauty still exists in the world. But this trip has been a great reminder. The Canadian Rockies disappear behind you as you start your descent. The train coils around the side of a mountain and along the edge of rocky bluffs. Next to you, not far off the edge of a cliff, a bald eagle rides an air current, its eyes pinned on a river hundreds of feet below. The train slows cautiously when it reaches a particularly steep part of the track. A mountain goat leaps across a chasm not far from your window and tilts its horned head toward you as it stands on a rocky ledge. It observes your passing train for a moment before continuing down the mountainside. Down, 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 the train continues to slowly spiral downward until you reach Pyramid Creek Falls, a 300-foot waterfall where glacier-fed waters cascade down sheer rocky ledges before flowing beneath into the Thompson River. When the train crosses the river, you look down into the gushing water moving swiftly over the rocks. The train continues downward, farther through the lush, evergreen dotted landscape, eventually leaving the snow-capped mountains behind as you return to the boreal forest. You let out a yawn and adjust your pillow as you pass through the shadows of the forest begun to rain again. Light raindrops create small ripples on a lake outside. Ducks huddle around the edges of the rocky shore. In the remote forest, you can spot deer walking along a rocky river shore. As the landscape flattens, the air grows misty, and even inside the train, you can feel coolness forming in the air. You pull your blanket up to your neck for warmth, condensation forming on your window 
as you lean forward to clear it away. You pass through the forest, past another passenger train coming from the other direction. As you continue through an evergreen forest, you come across an old logging camp where piles of timber are stacked in triangular piles ready to be floated down the North Thompson River. You imagine how refreshing the smell of the camp must be beneath the heavily foliaged branches. The train follows the North Thompson River, crossing it several times along the way. Eventually, it makes a stop in the city of Kamloops to let passengers off. You look out the window at the peaks of the Rocky Mountains behind. You feel more sleepy than awake now, and so you don't get off the train. After some time, the train leaves Kamloops and continues on. It slows down as it comes to a bridge spanning over a brook. The quickly flowing water below you tumbles over the mossy rocks in the middle of the stream. A man with a graying beard stands at the shore, holding a fishing rod in his hand. He gives the train a wave and a tip of his hat before returning his attention to his reel. Not far away from the man is a waterfall broken into three levels like steps of a staircase. Foamy white water flows along each layer of the rocky falls. Before long, the train crosses a sturdy iron bridge spanning the tumbling rapids of the Fraser River which flows all the way to your final destination of Vancouver. Overhead, Canadian geese fly southward in V formations. The forest gradually disappears again behind you as you reach the city of Abbotsford. The sun is low in the sky now casting a golden glow over the backdrop of small mountains behind the city. After some time, you come across a vineyard at the base of the hills. It is filled with long rows of ripe grapes ready to be harvested. You pass over a new Westminster Bridge which once again spans over the Fraser River. And after some time, you reach the suburban community of Burnaby with rows of houses along the track. Finally, the train rolls into its destination at Pacific Central Station. More than 3,600 miles after your journey began, the blue-green glass buildings of Vancouver come into view, shimmering in the setting sun. The train comes to a halt and passengers chatter happily as they prepare to disembark. You raise your arms over your head and yawn. You could easily spend the night right here. But it's time for you to disembark too, or else you might wake on a train heading back east. You step into a parking lot where a shuttle bus awaits you. You enjoy a quiet ride to your hotel located in downtown Vancouver. When you arrive at your hotel, you check into your room. Upon opening the door, 
you take a deep breath of the calming eucalyptus scent. You unpack, settle in, and get ready for bed. As soon as you pull the covers over you, you can feel yourself sinking into your mattress. From head to toe, every part of your body relaxes. As your eyelids gently close, the sound of the train chugging echoes in your head. And before long, you drift into a deep slumber. Good night and sweet dreams. <laughs>